David Morgan, author of The Silver Manifesto and founder of the MorganReport.com, says the Inflation Reduction Act, passed last week, does almost everything but address inflation. The misnaming bill, only accelerates the current trajectory of the United States and, does not end well. Based on the current geopolitical landscape, Morgan concludes, globalization is crumbling and fundamentally a failure. Listen to the full podcast to prepare for the massive economic crash, and are we on the verge of economic collapse? Please follow us on YouTube and open your notifications for further podcasts. Enjoy. And back with us, one of our all-time uh, most popular guests, David Morgan, publisher of The Morgan Report. Um, David, always good to see you. How are you doing, friend? I'm doing well under the conditions. Well said. Well, I think that gives us a good glimpse of, of everything we're going to talk on today. So, you know what? Let's just start with inflation and your thoughts on the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, not sure if you agree that it's not so much an inflation act, but really a climate bill in disguise. But as we know, if you use the word inflation, that it will give the optics that you're actually doing something to fight inflation. Am I wrong with this analysis? No, I can add on slightly, Daniela. First of all, if you really think about it, almost all of these legislations, these bills that are passed, the executive orders, um, talking primarily in the United States, but it's really globally. These are misnomers. In other words, the Patriot Act is anything but patriotic. This Inflation Reduction Act is almost anything but addressing inflation. And another thing that most of us know, but I think bears repeating, is in most of these bills that are passed, there's all kinds of what they call writers. Writers are additional legislations that are enacted when the bill is passed that's very little talked about. It's almost subterfuge. They sneak them in, so to speak. I mean, and most of the Congress critters don't even read the entire bill, but there's so much leverage in the propaganda press and the lobbyists that uh, most of these people are bought and paid for, as I've said in the past, and that's my firm, strong opinion. So it's going to maybe mitigate the propaganda press to look like the government's actually concerned and actually doing something. But as you said, it's really a watermelon, green on the outside, red on the inside, and it's really enacting more, turning the screws down on the populace at large. That's what it basically amounts to. And, and as you say, you know, the spin, you know, I was reading one headline from CNN opinion piece, the Inflation Reduction Act is a huge victory in this existential uh, fight. So uh, that's that's the spin on, uh, on 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 some of this. But let's talk about um, the the false calm that it's almost giving, right? Because you say the Federal Reserve has failed us. Less than one trillion was the total value of the Federal Reserve's assets in 08. To put that in perspective, you say in 2019 it was almost, it was up to almost four trillion. In November 2021, it had grown to about $9 trillion. As of this writing, it is over $12 trillion and growing fast. Yeah, well, we're going exponential, and that's something that most people don't understand. But once you go exponential, that's when you can get into hyperinflation. If you go back to the beginning of the crisis, and I'm talking the current one, 2008, and Hank Paulson basically asked for the banks to... Uh, do what he told them to do. I think it was like a one sheet of paper and he basically forced them into it. And that was going to be it. And I forget the number. I think it was 800 million, somewhere in that, that area. And now, as you just said, Daniela, we're looking at 12 trillion. So obviously from 0.8 trillion or maybe 1 trillion to 12 times that amount in that time frame, 2008 to 2022, we are on a trajectory that does not end well. Uh, how does it how does it end, David? What, what does it look like for you and how far out is it? Well, it's here. It's just that because it doesn't, there's no real point of demarcation. I mean, the one I just outlined, you could say, well, that's the beginning of the end. But most things don't end abruptly. I mean, even, uh, you know, taking a bowling ball off the Empire State Building, it's a pretty quick trip, but there is, you know, the degrees as it accelerates to terminal velocity and then it whacks into the earth. The point being is, as things slow down, they don't slow down for everybody at the same rate at the same time. 
So, but looking back in history, you're e it's easy to see that the contraction of the global economy is occurring and will continue for some time, and that globalization is basically a failure. You're seeing much more nationalism, nationalism throughout all sectors. I mean, you see, you know, Russia and China pulling away from uh, globalization. You see, uh, of course, the war in Ukraine, and a lot of nation states are thinking primarily how they can survive That's right. or what their specific needs are or what their productive capacity is and whether or not they want to sell it for dollars or Canadian dollars or Aussie dollars or euros or whatever. So people are looking after themselves more and more. So it's not going as more globalization It's going as less. And this is the breakup. Now, the powers that be what they feed us constantly through the WEF and other outlets is that, you know, they are in charge and they have this grand plan and they're going to green energy and they've got all our problems solved and all we need is a new central bank digital currency and yada, yada, yada. But that's not what's going to take place. There's going to be large disruptions and they don't have as much power or control as they pretend that they have. Tell us more about what you think will take place. I'm just fascinated by this conversation. I mean, what will what will take place for you? Well, again, it depends where you are, you know, and what jurisdiction, what your culture is, what your societal norms are. But basically, there'll be some places that really aren't affected that much. As you know, when I made my main trip to China when I was in Beijing and spent quite some time there with the mining bureau and exploring different areas. Mm -hmm. The phrase that I caught and I kept with me from then on is the emperor is very far away, mm. meaning that when I got out of these mining districts mm. that uh, they didn't really pay too much attention to central authority. They basically did what they'd done for you know several decades. And of course, they had you know overseers, you might say. And that's the point is that as government becomes less reliable, less trusted and more invasive, mm -hmm. people start to ignore it more and more and go their own direction. And that's what you're seeing basically, again, globally. And so what happens is they start to organize a collective within their own groups, which can be at the city level, can be at the state level. Let's take the state level as a good example. There are states that in the U.S. are called red or blue. I hate the political debate, but that's a fact. So some states may just say, you know, you've gone too far, meaning you cannot enact this legislation, Mr. Federalist. We have states' rights, and we're going to ignore that. And that's already taken place. Mm -hmm. So that takes it from, you know, 50 states united under one, quote unquote, color of law, and brings it back to the state level. So maybe you're one out of 50 that says, we're not going to take it anymore. We don't want this. We don't need it. It's not legal. And we're ignoring it. And you take that from the state level into the county level and then the county level down further. So that's what I see, Danielle. Is it going to be everywhere and always? No, there'll be a lot of, you know, that go along to get along and think that the, you know, the authoritarian powers are worth listening to. But the vast majority that I can determine in the U.S., although you wouldn't know it from the propaganda press, but if you do your own research on independent actual numbers, you will see that uh, there's a vast majority, what's normally referred to as the quiet majority or the silent majority, that have their own independent thinking and more self-reliant than uh, you would believe based on what you see on the common everyday news. So, so what's your concern there, though, that there'd be tremendous uprisings if everyone's just kind of decides to do their own thing? What's your worry? Well, my worry is basic needs. I mean, my worry is what's going to happen to the cost of oil, what's going to happen to the food supply, what's going to happen as inflation gets into a wage price spiral, where, let's say, big corporations are more or less forced to increase the wages so people can afford to buy their gasoline, their groceries, and then that pushes the gas and groceries further, higher, which means they put in more price or wage demands, and that spiral continues. That's one worry of mine. Another worry is just the, uh, the human nature being reluctant for change. You know, when you're used to getting your weekly paycheck or your bi-weekly paycheck and it's worth this much and it buys this much 
and now you go to your grocer and that product doesn't exist anymore or it's on back order. So all these disruptions are very upsetting to human nature. They want constants. They want mm -hmm. reliability. They want their faith to be, you know, uh, founded and, you know, the next tomorrow is going to be the same as today. So my concern is not so much that we can't get through it. This has happened throughout history. But my concern is what will people do or what will their reactions be? In some cases, they'll shrug it off and march on. In other cases, they'll scream for more government intervention, that you've got to give us more free stuff, or you've got to take care of this particular group, or our feelings are hurt, we need this. So it's going to basically bifurcate society, and I'm not talking just the U.S. alone, into basically two groups. Those that need Big Daddy to take care of them, and those that say, I don't need Big Daddy to take care of me, I'm an adult. 